I didn't understand a word they said. That was great. I've been thinking a lot about Christmas, doing a little research. And uh, I just want to share some thoughts with you today. This is not a deep sermon. We're not plowing in the depths of the Greek words today, and I'm not showing you things nobody's ever seen before. This is just a really simple message today, and I just want to share some thoughts with you. Number one, as you look at the front of your bulletin and you see that theme that we've been in, each one reach one, this is really important. We've talked about how important it is that there's a call upon our lives that we recognize that we make disciples. That is absolutely incumbent upon all of us who call ourselves Christians that we reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ, except that, here's the problem, that sounds really hard and complicated. As a matter of fact, I remember growing up, I grew up in a, uh, I grew up in a uh, church, and uh, boy, there was a period of time where one of the churches that we attended where my dad served as an associate was extremely boring. Now, I know what you're thinking, Pastor Tim, you're really boring, but not near as boring as what I grew up in. It's, it's amazing how far I've come. <sighs> And uh, I, I just couldn't imagine ever thinking that I wanted to invite somebody to church. I can remember sitting behind a doctor. He was a pediatrician. And I can remember he would go through the bulletin and he would check things off as we did them. Like, all right, that one's done. That one's done. And today you wonder why we don't put the order of worship in the bulletin? That's guy. That's because that guy. Because to me, worship isn't about checking off a list of things that we did, right? And so you don't know what's going to happen next. That's kind of fun, isn't it? Most of the time, I mess it up anyway, so you don't know I make mistakes. It's really cool. And so, as a matter of fact, church in general, and, and in many people's minds, the Christian life seems to be boring. And so I'm just thinking about Christmas. You know what? I like Christmas. Christmas is not boring. If you were here yesterday, you would say a big amen to the fact that Christmas is not boring. I mean, it was fun yesterday. It was a party, animals, it was amazing. People upstage dancing and carrying on and pancakes and sausage. Did anybody get any of that sausage? That was awesome sausage. And so I just want to talk about Christmas for a moment and some observations again about how this wonderful time of the year can apply to our Christian lives and help each one of us reach somebody with the gospel of Christ. Let's just talk about Christmas for a moment and look and see, number one, that Christmas is a beautiful picture of a personal celebration. Just say that with me, a personal celebration. We see this, for instance, when, when the angel comes and gives the good news to Mary, what's going to happen to her in Luke chapter 1. We see that Mary breaks out into a song. We call it the Magnificat or, or Mary's song, and it's a song of praise to God. It's just a spontaneous song. God's so good to me. He's sending salvation to the world. I get to play a part in that. Isn't that awesome? And so here's Mary. My soul doth magnify the Lord. She had a deep voice. <laughs> and, uh, and she's just rejoicing. I mean, she's going to have a baby. How is she going to explain this to everybody? And she doesn't even think about that. All she knows is she has good news. There's a song that's a modern song that says, Mary was the first one to carry the gospel. How awesome is that? The gospel uh, that would save the world was in her womb. And so Christmas is a personal celebration. Key word there, celebration. Are you with me? Here's the second thing that we see about Christmas, and that it's a familial celebration. Luke chapter 1, verse 39, Mary goes and, 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 and celebrates this coming of their babies with Elizabeth. And I love it. Elizabeth is carrying Jesus' cousin John in her womb, and when John's near Jesus in Mary's womb, John leaps. And, and, and can you imagine, some of you ladies have carried, many of you ladies have carried babies. I can remember when Angel Moses was pregnant with Ken. There's something that he did, and you could see his entire rear end go across her belly like this. It was kind of creepy, but it's kind of cool. It kind of reminded me of the movie Alien, actually. And can you imagine a baby doing a flip-flop? and the <laughs> Ladies, that would freak me out. But that's what's happening. Not only was there a, a celebration there with Elizabeth and her family, but Mary and Joseph. They kept these things to themselves, and they traveled together. And then when that, when that child was born, it was just them there for a while. And they celebrated the birth of their son. 
and they named him, and they had a party. It was a familial celebration. Key word there is what? Celebration. The next thing we see is in Luke chapter 8, the shepherds show up. We had shepherds here yesterday. One of them stood, one of these crazy kids right here, he, he took his shoes off and he laid him there and he got down on his knees on his shoes so it looked like his legs were about that long. It was hilarious. And the shepherds were out in the fields and they heard this angelic being and all these hosts of heaven declaring that Jesus was born and the, and, and, and the invita invitation went out. Come and see this thing that God has done. And so what did they do? They left their sheep. Not really smart if you're, if you're in the sheep business. They left the sheep, they went into town, and they were there. And, and the key word is they celebrated what God had done. Now, by the way, these strangers, these guys were poor, they were lowly, and they were dirty, but they were welcome. That's what Christmas is. Us who are poor, lowly, and dirty are welcome to come and adore we find out that days, weeks, maybe even months later, there in Matthew chapter 2 were wise men who came. We had some wise men there yesterday. They were dressed really nice. They had Frankenstein, Frankenstein I guess, frankincense, myrrh, and gold. And they were there to worship. And these guys were rich, and they were powerful, and they were foreigners. They came from way far away, and they came, and they were invited to come and adore Jesus. And they brought gifts, and they gave, and the key word was they were celebrating the birth of the Messiah. Now, I get this. We have locals who are Jews, who are poor, who are dirty, who are stinky, who are low class, and they're there. We have foreigners from out of town who are rich, dressed really nice, bringing presents, and they're there. Isn't that awesome? That's what Christmas is about. It's a celebration with family. It's a celebration with strangers, but not only that. I love this next part. You remember that when the angel came, the angel is the one who announced to Mary that she was going to have a baby. You remember when the shepherds were in the fields that night? Remember what it says? They were sore afraid. I don't know what it means to be sore afraid, but I think it means they were very afraid. Why? Because they were out there in the dark, in the middle of the night, camping out, and all of a sudden, the heavenly hosts came. And you know what they saw? They saw a party. They saw an angelic celebration. And so we not only have a personal celebration, not only a familial celebration, not only a celebration with strangers like shepherds and wise men, we also have the angelic hosts. We have rich, we have poor, we have young, we have old. How about Simeon and Anna in Luke chapter 2 verse 21? Simeon and Anna, old people who were waiting there at the temple. I think Daniel's one of his first Sundays with us here. I preached a sermon with a, with a terrible name called A Very Jerry Christmas. He was talking about old people at Christmas time and he could not believe that I would ever preach something so politically incorrect. Now he knows. Simeon and Anna there rejoicing because they had seen. I'm going to tell you, friends, the birth of Jesus Christ, it's a party. It's a party. It's a celebration. Celebrate the Lord. Come on. That's what was happening. And as a celebration, this was a vehicle for the gospel. Again, Luke chapter 2, verse 30. Here's the words of Simeon. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. This is the gospel. God has sent Jesus Christ, the world, yes, the Jews, yes, the Gentiles, can now be redeemed. Woohoo! And we think of church as... Won't you join me at church this Sunday? It's the best hour's nap you'll have all week long. I don't know. You take a good look. You take a good look at the birth of Christ. And you know what it really looked like? It looked like our church yesterday. I'm going to tell you, if pancakes and sausage would have been invented, they would have had it here. 
It was awesome. Now, I told you I've been doing a lot of research. I've just been looking into, again, just this origin of the celebration of Christmas because nowhere, I've looked, nowhere in my Bible does it say Jesus was born on December 25th. And you know what? I don't really care because the fact is my eyes have seen the salvation of God. Oh, some people say, hey, there was a Roman celebration called Saturnalia where they celebrated this god Saturn. And they, it was a time of lawlessness. And they would have all these feasts and all these parties. And at the end of it, they would sacrifice somebody. Doesn't sound like very much fun if you're the one being sacrificed. There was a winter celebration called Yule in the, in the Germanic tribes, and, and that's where we get the Yule log. And they would celebrate winter solstice, and there were all these pagan celebrations in the winter. And, and so the, the, the slam on, on Christmas is that, well, all they were trying to do was, all they were trying to do was get the pagans to stop worshiping their pagan gods and start to get them to worship Jesus. And all I can say is amen. That's pretty cool. That's pretty smart. Because everybody's looking for a reason to celebrate. Oh, Tammy said it earlier. We all need to have a little loy in our lives. Everybody's looking for loy. Well, that's dyslexic people at least. The rest of us are looking for joy. And the church, as, as flawed as it was in the dark ages, says, we're going to show you the true joy. And the true joy is that salvation has come to the world in Jesus Christ. And so they took these elements of celebration and instead of now saying the Christmas tree represents fertility, they said the Christmas tree represents Christ and his death on a tree and his gift for all of us. And they take all these things from all these things, they take them and they translate them into a new way to teach people about Jesus. The fact is, Listen to this. The fact is, Christmas is the greatest time of year for the gospel. It is absolutely a time when the whole world is open to an introduction to Jesus Christ. You can go to a mall and you can hear the same songs the choir sings. You can you could be in a bar, I'm assuming. I mean, some of you have told me this. And you can hear, oh, come, let us adore him. For heaven's sakes, even the lawyers celebrate Christmas. Not only is it the best time of year for the gospel, it's an excellent opportunity to reach out and share the love of God. Only the most hardened of atheists don't enjoy Christmas. It is an incredible time of year whenever the world's open to the things of God, giving gifts, coming together, celebrating goodness, celebrating family. It is an opportunity to reach out and share the love of God in a very real way. And again, yesterday was an incredible example of that. Yesterday we saw traditions, old and new, coming together. We saw giving, we saw fun, and yes, we heard the gospel. Even Santa Claus pointed children to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Christmas then is the perfect opportunity for each one to reach one. And let's just talk about some practical ways that we can do that. How about a Christmas card, number one, that shares the gospel of Jesus Christ? How about a card that says, Tammy this morning is wearing a really ugly Christmas sweater because that is a great way to celebrate what God has done. He has sent his son, Jesus Christ. How about cards sent to family and to friends and to coworkers, to teachers, to fellow students, and cards that say, today we celebrate because God sent his son into the world. How simple is it? Nobody doesn't like a Christmas card to open that up and to see right there the gospel message. Think about the possibilities. How about this? Get-togethers at Christmas where we just pause before the meal and we say, you know what? We're all gathered together and we're all dressed funny and there's lights and there's music and all this. And we're about ready to dive into these meatballs, but we're diving in for Jesus Christ because God sent his only son into this world. And that's why we're gathered together. We're glad to have you, neighbor. We're glad to have you, friend. We're glad to have you, coworker. We're glad to have you to come and celebrate with us 
this real reason for the season. How about this? Christmas caroling. When's the last time you did that? Go around, door to door, house to house, and say, we're here to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Do you care if we sing some songs for you? And then leave them with a little card, a tin of cookies, that explains to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you are kind of, I hate to say it, maybe you're just feeling a little old. I am. My back's killing me today. And maybe you're saying, I don't really want to party. Bah humbug. I don't really, I don't really want to do that. I'm just going to tell you something. There's nothing more awesome than going to Grandma and Grandpa's house and seeing Grandpa sit down with the kids before the presents are open and break open Luke and begin to read and explain to the children, this is why we open these presents. This is the story of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you right now, nothing will have a greater impact on your kid's life, your grandkid's life, than you sitting down and telling them about your Jesus Christ. I'm so blessed that I had grandpas like that. I never forget their prayers. I never forget gathering together at Thanksgiving and them declaring why they were so happy. I'll never forget the upstairs of my grandparents' house, totally covered with presents. And before we would go up, my grandfather would gather us all around and he would remind us why we were there and he would pray. Tell your grandchildren the Christmas story and they'll never forget it. How about this? How about for the kids in your neighborhood or the kids at your kid's school that are in your class, how about baking a kick tin of cookies and including a small children's Bible? Maybe with the verses of the children's story of Christmas highlighted and just give the kids in your neighborhood a little special gift. Celebrate Christmas. See it as a vehicle for the gospel. It's the easiest time of the year. The world is ready to receive. People are eager to hear. The world wants a celebration. And at Christmas time, we know absolutely that we have something to celebrate. Do you believe that today? Say amen if you do. But listen, I've been thinking about this. And I'm convinced that we should party every day like it's 1999. I'm telling you. Tia knows that song. <laughs> the kids are going, 1999? Let me just offer you some suggestions today. I want to redefine what church looks like. Are you ready? How about this? How about church looking like a fishing trip or a hunting trip, men? <laughs> yeah! How about church looking like a fishing trip or a hunting trip where you go overnight and you say, hey, man, one of our friends is going to share his story. And a friend shares a story about how he came to be a Christian or how his marriage was healed with his wife or about how his child was sick and God answered the prayer to, to heal that child. How about a time where you say, hey, we're going to go down. We're going to go down to the Gulf and we're going to go out on a boat and we're going to share stories about when Jesus was out on a boat or by the lake. And we're just going to have a great time together. Who's going to say no to that? Honey, I got I, I to gotta go fishing for Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I have to go hunting for Jesus. The church needs me to make some deer jerky. It's just my call. Somebody's got to do it. Think about it. What guy is going to turn down a hunting or fishing trip and an opportunity to be with other men and hear the gospel? How about this, guys? If you don't like to hunt or fish, how about golf outings? <laughs> Jim right there just perked right up. As a matter of fact, his arm reflexively hit Judy in the side. You heard that, didn't you? Preacher's telling me, take a golf outing. How about going overnight, play, playing two or three times, and, and, and as you're there, we're going to sit down and meal And our friend Joe, who's really a terrible golfer, but he has a great story about how Jesus has impacted his life. Ladies, I know you're feeling left out, so listen, Judy, you ready to get that elbow ready? How about overnight shopping trips to like Chicago or Atlanta? How about that, ladies? Woo! I thought I'd get an amen to that. 
And what about when we're out on the trip? Why don't you say to your friend who may not be churched or may not be a Christian, while we're out down in Atlanta, I've always loved to hear Charles Stanley. Would you guys, would you care if we went to his church Sunday morning and, and then we'll go eat some lunch and we'll go do some more shopping? Or, or we're up in Chicago and we're going to go to XYZ Church. Or, or, hey, there's a ladies' conference. Let's do this. Let's go to the ladies' conference and shop in all the breaks. What lady's going to say no? I'm going to tell you, a lady can't physically say no to that. And ladies, how about this? Shopping for Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? Oh, it's a party. How about birthday parties? We all have them. How many of you really don't like having them? Yeah, I understand. But how about birthday parties? Everybody gets together for a birthday party. Invite people over to the birthday party with this idea that we're going to celebrate not only my life, or my daughter's life, but Jesus' life. And we stop at that birthday party, and we go around the room, and we say, hey, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for Kelly and her 60 years. We're just going to pause. I'm just kidding. She's not 60, all right? She's close enough she can throw something, so I better be careful. We're going to celebrate her, and we just want to pause and give everybody in the room an opportunity to thank God for one thing about her life. Oh, what about weddings? I'll never forget my wedding. Yes, I can remember it. I have a bunch of heathen friends, trumpet players. Trumpet players are all heathens, all right? And, and we were all gathered together at, at our church, and, and we had this very informal meal. And the, the ladies of the church f fixed the meal for us. It wasn't anything fancy. I'll never forget that night. People started talking about Angie Mills and I and what we meant to them and, and, and just thanking God for certain aspects of our lives. And I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the place, including the heathen trumpet players. It was an opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about weddings as opportunities for a celebration? How about anniversaries? When the kids gather together and you're celebrating your 50th year or, or your 60th year and you stop and you just pause and you celebrate and you thank God for his faithfulness and you share with your kids your burden for them and you talk about the desired legacy that you want to leave in their life and you share about Jesus Christ. How about going bowling together? I can think of it right now. You can call yourselves holy rollers. It's awesome. <laughs> and you can, you can bowl for Jesus. Hey, man, hanging out in the gutters for Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. And think about it. You, you can purposely say, hey, man, we are, it's so much fun to have you with us. And bowling's great. You can talk about how bad you bowl, and then you can talk about Jesus in between frames. Did you ever think about that? How about this, a supper club? And you invite your friends who are Christians, but you also make sure you invite somebody that's not, or somebody that's outside of church. Or cookouts. Woo! Barbecuing animals for Christ. I think that's awesome. How about Super Bowl? People love to get together at Super Bowl. You know what? People don't really want to come to church for Super Bowl. I mean, we've done that. It's fun. But you know, you know where you want to be for a Super Bowl, don't you? You want to park your rear end in a recliner somewhere. And you want bowls of chips and nachos and guacamole and meatballs and all that kind of stuff to be within arm's length so you don't have to go anywhere. How awesome to invite some people over for the Super Bowl party and say, hey, we're going to have a special video during halftime. And, and you go online and you find a video of testimony of a great football player who's talking about what God's done in his life. Or you pause and you just share what God's done in your life. How about inviting somebody out to a new Christian movie that comes out and we have two or three of those a year. All I'm saying is this. In order to reach people with Christ, we need to start having parties for Jesus. Yeah. You can say amen. Because nobody wants to be a part of this. I'm so happy. Why don't you come to church with me? We will check things off together. <laughs> and after we wake up, we will wipe the slobber off our chin and partake of fun. Nobody wants to be a part of that. So think creatively. Church isn't just about what we do in here. And by the way, I think it's awesome that Tammy shared her loy with us today. Don't you? That makes, we have something to celebrate. And our walk, listen, 
Our walk ought to look like Christmas. Our, you know, the song laments, why can't it be Christmas all year long? And in the church we say it is. Because every day is a celebration of the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me leave you with this. This is from Jesus. I'm not going to go into a big extrapolation of what this is. Jesus is talking about the kingdom. He's basically describing that it's come to the Jews, but somehow the Jews are missing the invitation. But I want you to just see, just see generally what he's talking about here. Luke chapter 14, verse 15. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. Now I want you to just get this. The kingdom of heaven is like a big supper party. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? The kingdom of heaven is like a big party. And the master of the house is putting on the dog, as they say down here in the south. And the invitation has gone out to many. And he says, come, and now the time is ready. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must go up and see it. I ask you to be excused. The first guy was too interested about his possessions, and the keeping and the maintaining and the overseeing of his possessions to celebrate. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. He was too worried about his work to pause and to celebrate. And still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. He was too worried about his relationships to celebrate. Verse 21, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. The servant said, Master, it is done as you command, and there's still room. Then the master said to the servant, Go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of the men who were invited shall taste my supper. You see the heart of God. I want to have a party, and I want all of you to know that you're invited. Don't miss it. Here is how we present the gospel. We're going to have a party. We're going to bowl. We're going to fish. We're going to shop. We're going to have an anniversary. We're going to have a birthday. We're going to have a dinner. We want you to come. And at that party, we're going to share the love of God. In the past six weeks here at this church, we've had some serious parties. We've invited people to come and trunk or treat. And there were 500 people here trunk or treating. The candy went fast, didn't it? And you know what we did? We took that pagan nonsense and we translated it into a way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we had fun. We had ladies sit down in extravaganza and there was all kinds of fancy schmancy plates. The men actually took showers and came and dressed and, and cooked and cleaned and, and served. And the gospel was presented, God was glorified, and it was fun. Amen. And then yesterday, we got together and we shared the gospel of Jesus Christ in a fun way as we celebrated his birth. And no one was unwilling to hear and see. That's the kingdom. Won't you invite somebody into your life? And when you invite them into your life, show them the celebration that you have every day about what God's done for you. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for this party that's going on in heaven even as we speak. A party that says the world can come to know Christ. A party that says there's an invitation that's going to all that they can be a part of this heavenly reality. Father, forgive us where we've thought about your kingdom as being boring and dull and drudgery. Father, it's exciting. We pray that our lives would be exciting. And then in sharing them with others, they would come to know our exciting God who's done so many exciting things. And so we pray that as we celebrate, the world would come to celebrate Jesus Christ as well. Give us a new vision of what church is like. Give us a new vision of what our role in the church is like. And help us in translating that, reach a world with this wonderful invitation to your kingdom, to your party. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.